All right, we seem to have a good crowd that have joined us for our um, virtual art salon today. I wanna welcome everyone and thank you for joining. Uh, we've had several of these um, virtual art salons over the last month and they've been a huge success, averaging 60 to 70 people. We've also been having our monthly Thinker Thursday programs that have been a huge success as well. So we're really excited um, to have Anderson Ranch online uh, and to have you all join us here today. Um, Esther has been helping coordinate those events, uh, but she's also our featured speaker today. So a special welcome to Esther. She's gonna be in conversation with Andrea uh, and Andrea will introduce her in a moment. If you'll allow me just a quick minute to talk about the ranch, uh, as you've surely seen from our emails uh, and on our website, uh, the ranch is alive and well. Uh, it's a strong organization and we're excited to deliver our mission. While our campus is closed right now, the organization is at full steam. Uh, the staff are working remotely. We've pivoted a lot of our programming to be online. Um, those class sizes are very small. It's one-on-one -on -one mentoring. It's a live uh, interaction with uh, our great faculty that you've come to know over the years. The price point is lower. I really encourage you to go to the website and check them out. Some of them have sold out already. So if one of the courses you're interested in is sold out, please get on a waiting list. If we see enough uh, people, we'll add another session. But we've really, uh, we're excited about a very successful summer. Uh, we've added some uh, equipment and continued to build out our digital fabrication lab. So we've ordered some digital 3D ceramic printers so we can run some great ceramics courses remotely. We really wanna make the summer a great success. We're trying new things and the ranch is excited to have you sign up and join us. A few quick ground rules um, about today. Uh, one is, um, I just lost my ground rules. Um, Esther, I might have to make you jump in because I have the wrong notes in front of me. Can I ask you to give us our ground rules quick? I know you told me earlier to say them, but I've lost them. Um, so I think just uh, you know, the rundown of the program is that um, Andrea will uh, introduce me and then, <laughs> and then um, we'll kind of have like a, like a dialogue together and at the end, we'll certainly, you know, want to encourage people to ask questions. And so there's two ways you can do that. You can, um, at the bottom of your Zoom panel or Zoom window, you can raise your hand and we'll try to uh, let you speak and you can ask your question directly or you can type your question in the Q&A, which is at the bottom of your Zoom window as well. So either way you prefer, um, we'll try to get all the questions um, as best we can. But yeah, that's, uh, that's about it. Esther, thank you for uh, bailing me out there. I pulled up the wrong attachment. Uh, so uh, no thanks problem. for giving everybody the ground rules. Andrea, thanks for uh, being in conversation with Esther and uh, look forward to a really great conversation. Yeah. Great, thank you. Thank you, Peter. Um, I just wanna uh, introduce Esther a little bit more. Esther is the studio coordinator for photography and new media. She's been with the ranch for about a year and she's an amazing artist, which is why we asked her to present her work tonight uh, during the virtual art salon. Uh, Esther received her BFA in photography from um, Andrews University in Missouri. Is that correct, Esther? No, my BFA is in Michigan. In Michigan, sorry. And her MFA in studio art from the University of Arkansas. And she has participated in residencies in the national park system and has an upcoming one in Ireland. Uh, later this year. So um, something I wanted to sort of start, I uh, have sort of an opening question with, for Esther it, as, as she starts to show her work. Something I think about a lot when I look at your work is the history of landscape um, in, in, in art, the history in the sort of the romanticized landscape in painting, in the Western landscape and photography with people like Jackson, um, early pioneers sort of representing the West and sort of the, all its sort of open spaces. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about that in terms of how you enter that conversation um, relating to the history of photography and the history of representation of the landscape in your work. Sure. Um, well, I certainly, just to start off, I have a huge um, appreciation and respect for 
the history of photography itself and also the history of landscape photography. Um, I don't know if any of our viewers watched, you know, the last thinker Thursday and I did a presentation on um, you know, the, how photography was influential in the genesis of the National Park System, which I think is a really um, an amazing, you know, point of how powerful the medium is. And I, you know, I love Carl Watkins and Weston and, and like you said, Jackson and Ansel Adams. And then, you know, further through history, you look at Robert Frank and the new topographics and this new sort of wave of landscape imagery where there begins to you know, have like a, a creep in of, of, of a human element, I guess. And um, I think that that nature and landscape is a subject that, that humans and especially artists always seem to uh, go back to. And I think about like the industrial revolution when, you know, people had much more urban living environments and there was like a wave of a wave of paintings that were much more nature representations and people wanted them in their house because it was like this moment of like going back to you know nature going back to the the farmlands if you will and i think that that historically speaking you know the landscape representations whether they be a painting or a photograph they always seem to bear this weight of romanticism and um, nostalgia and I think that in part of my work um, I try to use that tradition as a reference but also disrupt it because I think where we are in our current climate so to speak we can't really afford to think about it in terms of the past we need to think about it in terms of the present and the future and uh, like a, a truly affected space um, and I think, you know, I was just reading online today that when, since COVID has started and isolation has started, that, you know, the CO2 levels or carbon emissions have dropped down, you know, between five and 10% in New York City. And I think that that's like a huge example of how our actions affect where we live. And that's kind of the things that I think about, um, you know, when I, when I think about landscape imagery and, and things like that. My, my love of land and my love of my appreciation of legacy certainly comes from um, a very familial place. Um, my grandparents, you know, have land that was passed down to them. And then my brother and I will be like the fourth generation or so to take over. So my, my love for it comes from a very personal place, but I also recognize it on a very global scale as well. Um, and just like speaking of these images in front of us now, um, there's certainly, when I like go out and photograph, I, you know, nine times out of 10, I'm like hiking or walking or something. I always seem to find something in the landscape that doesn't belong there, whether that be like a bottle cap or a beer can or a plastic bottle or, you know, fast food waste that's thrown out of a window. Um, I always, I always tend to ask the question, like, why is this here? And I think that this, these, like, you know, this series of geometric landscapes is certainly like an echo of that thought. And like, it's, it's not a, a normal object that you would find in some of these places. So that's kind of where this, um, this, these images came from. So that is kind of, you know, and I can talk about how I made them later as well. That's always a question I seem to get. So um, one thing I was thinking about as I looked at those first images, there was definitely something that references the traditional photograph or that kind of object of the print where, and I've seen the way they're presented, they're generally presented in a framed format and hung on the wall. So it's sort of a re-representation of the landscape, that disturbance, but then sort of referencing back to that original photograph. Yeah. And then... I know that the, the next work coming up, I'm interested in, um, if you could talk more about how you've moved from that to more of an installation, how you think about that object in the installation of a gallery space. Sure, um, yeah, I have several pieces that are, uh, you know, what I would say, break the frame or break the tradition. And I think um, for me as an artist, I, I find it important to question the like these boundaries that have been set before me and you know especially in this work I was mostly thinking about the frame and the rectangle and um, 
I think that, you know, that's been questioned by many artists before and many painters changing the shape of the canvas and things like that. And I think that I use that frame again as a reference to the tradition, but then, you know, like using this, this uh, object, which is a light box and having it hung in the gallery, you know, to where it has this image on it that, you know, it's sand, but it kind of also references the grain. Cause if you look really closely, like back in this image, like it looks like film grain, but then I really wanted to use that object in a contemporary way and make the artificial really come out. So it's kind of like I've carved into this image and essentially, you know, the landscape and I've really brought that artificial light through. And when I was hanging the show, it was actually really, really important to me it was one of the first pieces I put up because I wanted it to be really close to an outlet and having the cord was a really important factor for me because I wanted it to be, I didn't want it to be like this ominous light box hanging on the wall. Like I wanted to see the artificial cord coming out and that it was plugged in and that it was, you know, needing electricity and something that was again, artificial and not, um, not just like a glowing, glowing piece. Um, but yeah, scarring the landscape, cutting and having all those things, um, all those were really, really important to me. And again, using that, that box as a reference to history and using, the, and using that was also important. Um, yeah, so this is the next piece. So I, I know that as you continued on and your, as your work has evolved, you have also started to work with sort of time-based media and move bringing that into your work. Can you talk more about that? Sure. Um, I, I think that in a lot of these images that you'll see, I certainly sort of poke at some of the fundamentals of photography. Um, and time is certainly a, a very large one. And I first want to talk about how this piece was made. So while I was an artist, at, an artist in residence at a national park, I was walking a lot of the same trails um, over and over again. And so I had this idea um, like what if I took the image back to the actual space? What would that look like? So I made a print and I took it back to the same location where I took it back to its origin, if you will. And um, I think about, you know, also if you think about like Mark Klett's uh, re-photographing series where he takes these images by Muybridge and all these other, um, you know, like really historical photographers. And that talks about time in like a much larger span. But this is certainly, um, this is certainly a, no, a nod at how an image is, you know, it's one fleeting moment, and then also how representation is different from the actual space that it, that it you know, is supposed to replicate, if you will. Um, and so I made a GIF, I took the image back to this creek, and I placed the image in the water, and then um, I made this, you know, sort of live action film, if you will. And again, it, you know, goes back to the rectangle. It's like, a, it's, you know, this image of water has now been confined to four right angles, and now it's in another right, even right now, like I'm looking at four different, four different, you know, rectangles that this exists in. And so it's like how we contain all these elements that we, that we look at in nature, which is, you know, all around us. Um, so. And I think it also talks about how representation should be questionable. And I think, I mean, at least if we should question representation um, and, its, and its nature. So I think um, this is a still from that, from the GIF. And then this is another piece that um, sort of hints at time as well. It was an image that I simply had projected onto the gallery wall and it was going in and out of focus. And it was never still, it was never, it never sat um, in the focus, it never sat out of focus, it just was constantly moving. And that was more interesting to me to watch the time that viewers spent with it, because I think that's another element of looking that we all um, consider. You know, if we look at images on our phone, it's very quick. If we look at images, you know, in our house, we probably may disregard elements of them. Um, but this was one of those things that just went back and forth and back and forth and, you know, the image became clear, but then it also became like blocks of color and shape and again, it became much more objectified. Um, so that was just, it was kind of interesting to watch people watch it. And there's an the installation view of that one. Um, so something else that you haven't spoken about yet that I, I, I'm, I'm aware of, and I think it's with some of the work that's coming up now, mm -hmm. uh, 
it's also like like this becoming like this different sculptural piece in the gallery and like changing the horizon line you know but there's also if you i don't know if you can jump forward a slide um there's this whole idea of like just installation how you're moving how you start breaking up the image and moving into these sort of abstractions but making them into sculptural forms and installing them in the gallery as like a new piece mm -hmm. talk about that Sure. I think that, um, you know, it's important for me and in my whole process of like making, um, thinking about how I can activate a photograph in a non-traditional way. Like how can I activate it not in a frame? Um, and even though some of my pieces eventually go back into the frame, um, it's still activated in a different way. But certainly, you know, using the architecture of the galleries, uh, you know, having things in a corner, disrupting, of what you might think of as a normal horizon line and now to me this becomes a little bit more of a of about texture and a tone scale and it it breaks apart what might be uh like automatically thought of as a horizon line and it by disorienting the viewer and disorienting the image it totally objectifies objectifies the photograph as an object, and then in turn objectifies the landscape as well, which is kind of the you know the core concept behind a lot of this work is like using that using the photograph and using that paper as a metaphor for like manipulating and bending the landscape that it represents. Um, and then also, you, I also thought a lot about um, like the windows versus mirror theory and how you know historically you know, photographs have been this either considered like a reflection of something of ourself or this portal into another place. And my goal generally is to very much disrupt that expectation and to make it more about ink on paper and, you know, a, a representation rather than an actual space, if that makes sense. So I know that some of the work sorry, that's coming up also deals with humor. And I'm wondering if you could sort of um, move into a conversation about that. I think this is the first slide. And it, it comes off of this idea of installation. It comes off of this idea of, of kind of a representation. And it, this, this piece here with the, with the rock, the rock collection, really kind of pulls all of your work together in terms of like, the image, the framed image, the sculptural form, and then something that's a little bit more um, active in terms of the audience participation. So can you sure. comment on that? Yeah, um, I, I, this is probably one of the, the funnest, um, mo I love this piece uh, a lot, actually. I do too. <laughs> um, I think that, so this is my rock collection, as I call it. Um, that's the title of it and each piece of individually has its own title but if you think of like you know a kid who's out exploring you know just kind of like having that freedom and that wandering you know they they have they get like a little rock collection and they find all these cool rocks and and this was kind of like a little bit of a nod to that and and my rock collection is just the same rock but as many times as i wanted essentially and um it kind of when i was in grad school and I was in a contemporary art seminar, and we talked a lot about Joseph uh, Kusu's uh, One in Three Chairs, and it is a piece strictly about representation. And it's, um, I think that subliminally, subliminally, it affected me way more than I thought, because then when I was putting this together, I like saw the historical reference kind of come together. And um, I think that it, it also talks about representation, form of representation, things like that. And kind of the humor that comes into it is, um, I, I really love a good pun. So I made this, the, the piece on the pedestal is called A Thousand Rocks. And so it's a thousand Xerox copies of the same rock and viewers were invited to participate and take one if they wanted. And that kind of also touches on the reproduction element of photography, again, going back to all the fundamentals. And I know that historically that's kind of like a, a soft spot because, you know, in the, our digital world, it's like, oh, well, we can just make as many as we want. And so I kind of just wanted to poke fun at that. So that was kind of where that humor came in. And um, 
I really, I enjoy it. And one of the cool, the cool thing about making that was that I like had to sit at the coffee machine for so many hours and just do like 10 at a time. And so it was, sometimes it would get, would get jammed and I'd have to start all over again. I don't know. It was just, it was a fun piece to make and I really enjoyed it. So that was, that was kind of that piece and I, I love it so much. Um, but this is kind of an installation view of the majority of the pieces that we talked about. Um, just kind of see, I wanted to show how they interacted with each other. Um, Cause I think that that's a really important um, idea to think about when you're in a gallery space and when you're thinking about like all these, cause nothing is the same. And I kind of really liked that about the show. And so thinking about how they all interact with each other was something really important that I wanted to do. Um, and so I just wanted to show what that the space kind of looked like with all of them inside. Great, thank you, Esther. Sure. Uh, I think what we're gonna do now is open it up to some questions from the audience. And we actually have one here. This question is from Zakria Rabani, who's the uh, coordinator for sculpture here at Anderson Ranch. And he asks, um, He's curious as to how much the role um, concept plays in your art, especially as you talk about your photography and its relationship with sculpture and installation. Do you see yourself, do you see yourself in the future using more sculpture installation or sculptural and installation, installation strategies um, and less traditional photography or is it always going to be a blend? Um, that's a great question. And I think that f at least in my thought process, I always start with the photograph. I always start, um, you know, I think very photographically and I think very much like a, what I would call like a straight photographer. I'm not, I don't do anything, uh, I don't know, abnormal. <laughs> I don't know if that's a proper term, but I shoot very straightforward. And I think that for me, that's always how it starts, but I do have a lot of ideas um, like in the future of how to make like an image sculptural and then how to make it come off the wall even more and to make it like more interactive to where you do activate all sides of it. And I think that that is a, that's an interesting way to keep pushing um, this concept of like using that photograph as a metaphor of how to like make, transform a landscape um, in some manipulated way. Um, we have another question which it really relates to the national parks uh -huh. and um, the person is asking this is anonymous but it, the person is asking why national parks and what about different types of parks and, and I think that's an interesting question especially as it relates back to kind of the history of photography in the West. Yeah um, you know a lot of the spaces that are in this body of work are not necessarily national parks some of them are some of them are just like really beautiful sides of the road um, that I've been on back roads kind of documenting. But I think that the national parks, I think it's so, it's so America. And I think it's really an important factor of how we experience landscape. And I think that, you know, we have this idea of what, of what nature is. And I think that that's, I think that that's shifting um, quite a bit because I mean, I read a lot of John Muir's books and he would like put a loaf of bread in his pocket and go out in the Saharas for, or sorry, in the Sierra Mountains for like four or five days at a time. And how we experience nature now is, is not like that. And so I think that as we continue to evolve, our idea of nature is gonna change. And I think that it's gotten to where like we think that a national park really is experiencing nature but i would argue it's maybe experiencing um, more of like our natural monuments that have been protected rather than that like really being secluded um experience because also i mean if you go to a national park i went in 2017 and yosemite had over 6,000 visitors and it took me like three hours to get in and it wasn't like it wasn't a i didn't feel like i was in nature i, I it felt a little bit like just <laughs> to be a tourist attraction. I have a follow up to that, and that is do you think that um, as you think about nature, that that is, and you're saying, you know, that's changing, and we all, all have these sort of mediated experiences with nature as well, like whether people are photographing out, you know, with their iPhone out the car window or not really, you know, moving into that landscape? Do you think that's changing because of COVID? How we all experience nature and think about nature 
being sort of in a situation where most of us, you know, are stay at home? Yeah, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know how this, um, how this pandemic and being isolated, um, yeah, I, you know, that's a great question. I think that, I think that nature is still one thing that we're kind of, it's acceptable to do. And I would hope that that encourages more people to be out in it and to explore more outside of what maybe what they would do, you know, if COVID hadn't happened or if we weren't at stay at home orders. And I think that, um, I, I don't know. I, I think that nature is just, it's getting smaller and smaller. And I don't mean that in like a geographical sense. I mean, in like it consumes less and less of our uh, concern maybe, and also of our like mental state, even though nature, as I said in the beginning, was something that we always go back to, to sort of, you know, recenter ourselves, at least myself. And I, I, I don't think that that's a generalization that's far from, you know, saying that about everyone. It's like, oh, I want to, I want to touch base with myself. I'm going to go out in nature. And I think that, I hope that that is, is taken seriously during this this time of um, isolation. Um, we have some more questions from the audience. Um, and I, I wonder if we can unmute. I know Betsy Schneider, sure. who also teaches with us at Anders Ranch, is, has a question. I wonder if we can unmute her so she can ask that. Um, sure. Hang on, let me find. Did she raise her hand? Oh, there she is. Betsy Schneider, you said? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, I'm allowing her to talk. Okay. Betsy, are you there? Can, I'm here. Great. Yeah. yeah. Um, I have a question, but it goes back. I mean, I actually have another question about nature too. So sure. but, um, but I'm gonna go back to, to my first question that came while I was, while you were going through. I, all these sculptors, and I don't know a lot of sculptors, so they're kind of big names came to me while I was, um, I mean, Nam June Pike immediately with, with the, um, the monitor and the cord, mm -hmm. um, Cornelia Parker. And I actually think it's the piece in the corner, which looked on the screen like it was three dimensional, but I, I thought about her work that really does, I mean, her, her work does deal with I, nature as well. But then, and then Felix Gonzalez Torres with the sure. takeaway. Of course. And uh, I guess I wanted to ask a little bit more, cause you talk about, I mean, you start by talking about, uh, you know, the survey photographers, I feel like it, that's very, very traditional photography. And then you're in conversation with more contemporary sculptors. Mm -hmm. um, I, I guess, let me turn the, I, I mean, it's important to you to think about how that tradition, the sculpture tradition or the installation or um, is a part of your practice or do you feel like it's, uh, yeah, I guess that's the question a little bit more about that what what your what your thought is about your conversation with these sculptors not those in particular but yeah um that's a great question i my relationship to sculpture um before i started working in spain was like can i can i glue it <laughs> like that was the question um and i think that you know i my relationship to sculptures is certainly just from a like no a knowledge standpoint and I, I think that that will continue to grow. But like I said, I just like my mindset is always in a photograph and slowly asking the question, like, how can I break that? Then it like comes off the wall. And so I want that relationship to deepen and I want the skills to do it. That's another thing that I felt hold me back when I was making this work was that I had a very limited skill set that I was working with. And now I want to push that further so I can deepen that relationship with like the idea of an actual sculpture. And like thinking about how, you know, Letha Wilson certainly is a photographer, but her work is more on the sculpture side than the photo side. And then, and I think my work still exists on that photography side more so than sculpture, if that makes sense. Yeah. Can I, can I bring a follow-up question point and then I'll step back because there's other people. Um, well, while you're talking, and it, this comes back to the COVID too thing, I think there's a certain physicality, right, to sculpture that isn't there in mm -hmm. traditional photography. 
-hmm. And it's interesting. I mean, you think, of course, Olafur Eliasson, but I think that that is a really important part of what your work is asking us to do, is to mm -hmm. think about the sensory. And I think COVID is making a lot of us think the value of touching, um, the value of, of what's the difference between the virtual and the actual physical. And I think that there's an echo in that in terms of nature. So I'm actually, sorry, I'm more in professor mode than question mode. But no, I think that's okay. <laughs> really interesting things about your pictures literally coming off the wall where this idea of of needing to do more than just create photographs like ide no, idealized or objects flat rectangular objects but that that nature's asking for more than that too yeah. and that our experience that we need a, a more uh, a more three-dimensional more physical more visceral experience to kind of think about this exactly yeah was that a question or do you want me to <laughs> True or false? <laughs> True. <laughs> no, that's a, that's a great point. And I think that, I think that, you know, you probably said it better than I could, but yeah, it, it is, it do, we do need to have a disrupted view of this beautiful, I think, to get the point across and that if having this uh, like romantic ideology, like it's, it's not okay thinking forward right yeah oh I, yeah <laughs> okay thanks <laughs> no thank you betsy <laughs> thanks betsy um so we have a couple um we have a couple more um questions in the q a i'd like to get to before we wrap up sure. um there's someone that's asking like um i see so many long low seemingly infinite horizon lines in your work I'm wondering if going from the grasslands to the prairie to the jagged high horizon of the mountains is informing your practice in a different way. So in, in, a, in another way, how is being here in Colorado um, informing your practice? From um, yeah, so I, uh, I love a good horizon line and I'm sure that's evident in some of these images. Um, it's also a very, it's a very orienting, stable element of a landscape photo. And again, you know, using that and altering the horizon line, um, that's something I, I have done. Being in Colorado has certainly, like around me, the horizon line is not like, it's not a straight line, obviously. <laughs> it's a very crooked and jagged one. And I think being in Colorado um, and being around so many amazing artists here at the ranch, it's certainly changes um how i think about like landscape and and people here are very different in how they interact with landscape than um you know folks in arkansas where it's you know just a very different landscape people have a very different idea of of being outdoors um and so I, that has sort of shifted my view in a, in a good way for sure i also am fascinated with maroon bells and i um I don't know how or what it looks like yet, but I want to I want to do something with images from the from the bells because I'm fascinated with the fact that it's the most one of the most photographed mountains in the country. And I think that you know the amount of visitors that it has and the fact that you have to take a bus to it and all of these things, um, it's kind of, it makes me think about again that really like tourism feel. Of, of nature and so I want to kind of explore that a little bit more uh, for sure in the when it gets accessible uh, because of it seems like that sort of fits with your work in terms of questioning like what's authentic and what's not and and mm -hmm. what's an authentic experience in the landscape and what is a mediated artificial experience exactly yeah because it's you know when you go to any national park or any you know, even at the just think about the bells how you know you walk up you're dropped off or you park in this one specific parking lot and you have a very curated set up view for you and you know i've last summer i went several times you know very early in the morning and everyone gets there because they want to be <laughs> at one specific spot when the sun rises and you know you can't blame them because it's beautiful but everyone vies for this one specific spot and i just i it fascinates me and so i i want to explore that quite a bit more and i'm fortunate enough for it to be right down the road so hopefully i can get to that this summer when i'm not on zoom <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> um, we have one last, I'm going to sort of one last question from the audience and that is from Don Boyd. And he asks, he says he likes how you use motion and physical objects to create meaning in, in your landscape photographs. Mm -hmm. But have you also, have you thought about integrating sound? Yes, actually I have. Um, a lot of times when I've gone out um, shooting or hiking or whatnot, I have recorded quite a bit of sound. Um, and so I have a bank that I that I have thought about using, but I don't really know how. Um, but I do think it adds like this extra sensory to like when you look at something, but then when then you hear it, it adds like a whole other dimension. And I think that that could be a really uh, productive way to sort of activate that image in another way, like I was saying. And and yeah, I have thought about it, and um, I'm I hope that that is in the future and more video as well, because I think that that can also have a powerful um, effect and, you know, integrate time more as well. So, yeah. Great. Well, thank you, Esther. Thanks so much for sharing your work today. Sure. Thank um, you. I have a couple things just to note. Um, coming up next on the next Art Salon, uh, next week, Tuesday, May 12th, we will have artist Tom Sachs in conversation with our director of painting and printmaking, Liz Farrell. So that will be at 4 p.m. March, uh, May 12th. And our next virtual Thinker Thursday is May 21st at 4 p.m. So please uh, join us again. I would love to have more people continue to experience the ranch and our programs virtually right now. And um, these art salons are also added to, I'm sorry, I've, I've been seeing other people pop in. Um, these art salons are added to our YouTube channel and our website. Um, the last Thinker Thursday and all of the art salons are, are uploaded to the Anderson Ranch YouTube channel so and the ranch's website. So you can go back and look at those as well as any future Zoom webinars. And um, also just check out our online workshop offerings. We have moved our workshops, the majority of our workshops online this summer. And we hope um, many of you will think about signing up with us and, and experience a virtual workshop with us until we can get back in person in 2021. Um, and lastly, we are open and we are going to have some art making experiences on campus this summer. So keep checking our website and we hope we can, if you're around and you're in the area, we can see you in person. And again, thanks a lot and um, we're gonna sign off. Thank you. Hi guys, thanks so much.